Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Thursday, May 20th, and we'll be starting with S3, which is an act relating to insanity and competency to stand trial. Just by a um, little bit of background, um, the House passed S3 last week, just last week, um, and it went back to the Senate. And um, I thought we were finished with the bill, but I uh, looked at the Senate's calendar, I think it was probably Tuesday night, and noticed that there um, was a further instance of amendment and uh, asked um, legislative counsel, as well as our some of our colleagues in um, House Healthcare and health, health institutions, corrections institutions that we've been working with to take a look at the Senate language as it was coming over to us to see if if um, we could concur with that, because that would be the next our next step of um, of action. And there were sections uh, there that um, that at this point we could not concur with. So yesterday, um, again, some of us from uh, judiciary as well as the other two committees uh, met with Ledge Council and uh, have a proposed amendment, further instance of amendment that uh, I hope the committee will support and that we will recommend to the House. And uh, that is what attorney um, Katie McGlynn is here to walk us through, as well as um, give us a, um, sort of a high level understanding of what the Senate did pass. And uh, it's actually on our notice calendar today, but um, I'm hopeful that we could take it off the, uh, get real suspension to get it off the notice calendar because because it is a very, very important bill to, to many of us. So with that, good morning, Katie. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council. Um, so can you remind me, am I, is it okay if I share a document or share my screen in this, in this committee? That, that, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I will pull up, I've put together a side-by-side -side summary and I thought for our purposes this morning, this might be the best way to kind of see quickly the changes that the Senate made to the House um, version of the bill. So just to kind of show you where we are, um, this column is the as passed House version. So this is what the bill looked like when it left the House. And then yesterday, the Senate adopted um, a concurrence with, for per with further proposal of amendment, and that's what is in this last column. So if you remember, the House added many members of the to the forensic care working group and they removed, the House removed representative of BGS. The Senate's proposal added that representative of BGS back in. Um, next. Actually, excuse me, um, Katie, I'm sorry. Representative Marcy has her hand up. Oh. I just wondered if the, this document could be emailed to me, please, that shows the differences. Sure, I can do that. That, that would be great, thank you. Okay. Um, I let's see. I could do it when I'm after I'm done sharing my screen, or maybe Evan is able to do it now. Evan's able to do it now. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Evan. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. Both. And I and um I also if they're not posted already, they they will be posted to our website. But I think they're they're posted on our committee page. So thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Katie. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next piece of this section six um, was a study that looked at the overlap in the mental health and criminal justice systems. And the, the original Senate version had kind of a one-time report back and the House, as you remember, changed the structure um, and created more of a tiered decision-making process with a first and second preliminary report and then a final report on a number of particular components. Um, and kind of the concept behind that was particularly with regard with a forensic treatment facility, determining whether a facility was needed before looking at, um, you know, the size and scope of such a program and facility. So the Senate um, changed that structure. And instead of having two preliminary report backs um, before the final report, there's only one preliminary report. And the focus of that preliminary report wasn't providing recommendations as was the house version. It was just to give a summary of the work to date. So both the first um, preliminary report that came out of the uh, house version and the only preliminary report that came out of the 
Senate version both have the same due date of January 15, 2022. However, the final report date was different between the two. So the House version had a due date of September 15th, whereas the Senate version that was adopted yesterday had a due date of August 1st. And then with regard to some of the specific co components in the report, there were changes. For example, um, the House version asked um, that the work group look at any gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure. And then the Senate added related to individuals incompetent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. Also um, in the House version, there was a component about looking at competency restoration models. The Senate and their amendment chose to remove that from this particular report structure and have it um, stand on it by itself as its own standalone report with a later due date in 2023. Um, the House, the Senate accepted many of the changes that were made in the House with regard to the different components of this um, mental health and criminal justice report. Um, however, with regard to forensic treatment facilities, the House had added language, um, excuse me, not facilities, but models for forensic treatment. The House had added language, including inpatient community-based or other treatment models. And instead, the Senate sent back um, models for forensic forensic treatment, including the size, scope, and fiscal impact of any treatment facility. So again, that's sort of the piece where we're removing that tiered decision-making, and instead of assessing whether there's a necessity for a facility, um, including as part of the, the ongoing report, um, what would a facility look like? What does it um, need to have to be functional in Vermont? And then there was, um, you know, Senate lang excuse me, House language about additional recommendations um, and it had qualifying language and the Senate removed that to just say any additional recommendations. So I think we've already covered, oh. Excuse me, um, uh, Representative Marcia, your, your hand has been up. I just wanna make sure you don't have I'm another sure, question. I'm sorry, I didn't get it down. That's, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. And, and I, I, I still have not received from Evan the document. I just sent it a, a minute ago. Um, I had to download the document myself for okay, thank some you technical things much. behind. Thank you. Okay, so we um, pretty much already covered this forensic treatment facility piece. The House had a second preliminary report focused on whether a facility is necessary. The Senate deleted that in their proposal yesterday. Um, there was language in the House version and in the Senate version, but a standalone report on notice to prosecutors regarding um, orders of non-hospitalization. The Senate kept that language. Um, again, we've already covered this, but the competency restoration models, it's now and the Senate version in its own standalone report that's due January 15th, 2023. Um, and then really the rest of section six was the same. There are a few little technical changes to make the different pieces work, but substantively the remaining sections were the same of the Senate proposal. The biggest difference was in section seven. So um, the House version of the bill added two members to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, one member from the House Healthcare Committee and one senator at large, and the Senate deleted that whole section, meaning that the committee would stay the size that it currently is. So those are the changes that um, came, came to you from the Senate yesterday. So I'll stop sharing this document. And if you'd like, I can jump to the latest language with the House proposal, if that will work. Thank you, I'm not seeing any, not seeing any hands, thank you. Okay. Okay. So this is the proposal on the table right now from the House to go back to the Senate. Um, and I've highlighted the changes to um, kind of give you a sense of what the moving pieces are. So if, as you remember, um, the, the Senate yesterday added a rep from BGS back in that has been accepted by the House in this version, and that language remains. And then we move into the language about this um, 
criminal justice, mental health um, kind of structure report, you'll see that the August 1st date that came over from the Senate was accepted. Um, and then we move into the different components of what would be included in this report. So um, noteworthy here, they remember that the Senate took this competency restoration model piece, took it out of this report and had it as a standalone report that was coming in at a separate date in 2023. This is back in the big report that's due in 2022. So that has been moved. Um, much of the language um, changes have been accepted here, including limiting subdivision eight, H to any additional recommendations. Um, in G, the language that the Senate sent over about forensic um, models for forensic treatment, including size, scope, and fiscal impact of a facility has been accepted. However, um, there's and sort of an extra layer on this particular piece that we'll get to, which is why it's highlighted to kind of draw your attention there. So, me, Katie, um, just want to point. So, this is the final report. This is the I final, just, yes. And I just I wanted to make sure uh, committee members and uh, others who are, who are watching understand it that this is the this is the final report. And, um, and the way it's, it's structured is that we look at the final report first, and then we'll look at uh, reports that are submitted before that. So just mm -hmm. want folks to keep that in mind. Thank you. Yeah, that's not structured in a chronological order because in this subdivision two that we jumped down to, now we're talking about the preliminary report. So this report, January 15, 2022, comes in before the final report in August of 2022. And much of the um, Senate's language has been accepted uh, with regard to the, this preliminary report summarizing the work completed um, in subdivision one that we just went through, except the preliminary report is not going to touch on the work completed with regard to the forensic treatment facility. So that's a change in this draft. This um, forensic treatment piece is carved out from the the preliminary earlier report. And I see there's a hand. I don't know if you'd like me to pause. Um, yeah, thank you. And actually, before I, I call on Martin, and that, um, what we're looking at now is very important um, piece to the house because, you know, the idea that, um, you know, any, um, any decision or recommendations or anything about a forensic treatment facility would come later. First, the other um, recommendations, considerations need, needed to be looked at, at you know, first. And so that's why there's this, this separation and the preliminary report excludes um, the, the language in, in G regarding the forensic treatment um, facility. And I, and I know that that, that was um, important to some com um, committee members here as well. Uh, Martin. Uh, it, it's a simple question, I believe. Uh, I just am confirming uh, in the house past version that we sent out uh, last week, the subsection B, that, that was the preliminary report. And now this has changed to a final report. I just want to make sure. Um, so I, I believe the structure is the same. Um, oh, so sorry, are you talking, you're talking about the original house version that went over. Um, the Senate changed that one to the final report. Right, so, but your question is about the house version that left no, I last want, week. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, that we had on uh, January 20, 15th, 2022, that it would be a preliminary report. And now that has turned into the final report. I, I don't think I'm following. So B1 yeah, yeah. is the final report and that's due uh, August of 2022, August 1st right. of 2022. Yeah. August 1st it is. It's just, I, I, just, if, just looking and I suppose people won't be looking back at the, uh, what we passed out last week because B1 uh, was a preliminary report. It was a different, we have a different structure now in other words. It is a different structure. So the, the version that the house um, passed the preliminary reports were much more substantive. They were they contained um, recommendations, and the final report was only really fine tuning those recommendations. So that was um, 
structured in chronological order. The Senate's version that they sent back and that you're amending here kind of flipped that because the final report is where all the substance was located and their preliminary report was really just a status update on the work. So that was kind of a, a almost a, a tag a tag on at the end. Um, so that is sort of why the um, structure has been flipped, but it, I, I hear that it is, it is confusing to follow along and see the final report first and then get to the preliminary report. Thanks. So I'm gonna keep moving along. So we've, we've covered that this forensic treatment piece is carved out of the preliminary report that's coming back on January 15th. Um, however, there is another report that is um, required by this language, and that is the ONH, um, the prosecutor notification on orders of non-hospitalization. This was in, I think, every version of the bill so far. Um, what is changing here is that we've kind of separated this out to be part one of the report that's coming on January 15th, 2022. And now there is a new, subdivision C2 due on February 15th, 2022. And this is sort of the preliminary report for the forensic treatment piece. And you'll note that um, because it's coming in a month and a half, is it a month and a half or a month? Uh, a month later than the first preliminary report, then the work of the first preliminary report can be used to um, kind of inform the work that's coming in with regard to models for forensic treatment facility. So this summarizes the work completed to date by the working groups uh, regarding models for forensic treatment, including the size, scope, and fiscal impact of any forensic treatment facility pursuant to the, the subdivision up above that we looked at. So it's kind of, again, tiering that decision-making with regard to the forensic treatment models. Um, from there, we have mostly technical changes to make the different pieces work. Um, the version that came over from the Senate had a, 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 um, a section D that has been removed and everything's been renum renumbered. That was the competency restoration piece. So these highlights with regard to subsections B and C are just meant to show that reference to subdivision D has been removed. Um, and then sort of a similar thing is happening here. We have um, language that um, final, the final report that's coming in in B1 is to be um, include proposed draft legislation. And that requirement also applies to the preliminary or to the report on um, prosecu prosecutor notification for orders of non-hospitalization, that's C1. But C2 is not included because it's uh, C2 is the preliminary report on the forensic treatment piece. If there's any proposed legislation needed, that would be captured in B1 when the final report comes in. And that is really it for changes. I will take this document down so you can see each other. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate Katie was available quite late last night, so I really, really appreciate you working so hard and, and long on this to help us hopefully get to the finish line. Coach. Uh, Katie, can you give us a little, uh, uh, at least your observation as to um, section seven, uh, the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee? Uh, and the fact, uh, or what was the rationale behind uh, not adding that uh, additional membership that the House suggested? Sure. Um, so members of Senate Judiciary and Senate Health and Welfare met yesterday morning in a, in a joint committee meeting. And I believe at that time, some of the comments had to do with the fact that the House um, does already have an at-large member and it could be up to the speaker's discretion to appoint somebody from house health care if that seemed like the, the expertise that was missing from that particular committee. Okay, okay thank you. Any other 
questions? Barbara. So the draft legislation piece is new. Um, is led to council on this or who was envisioned drafting this legislation? So just for clarity, the draft legislation piece has been there um, for every version that's been adopted okay. so far. Um, Thank you. And yeah, that sometimes um, it, it's not uncommon to see language like that when, um, when a report back is required to come with proposed draft language. I believe I am frozen. You are, but we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. So was Ledge Council staffing? I forget if Ledge Council was staffing this or not. Do we have we both Barbara and Katie are now frozen? Am I right? <laughs> oh no, Barbara's back. <laughs> I'm unfrozen now. I don't know if you heard the rest of my response. I, we, we didn't. Thank you. Okay. Um, I said that the, the, the language about including um, proposed draft language has been there since the right. beginning. Um, and I also said that it's um, not totally uncommon to require um, proposed draft language. It doesn't specify, of course, that it's coming from the Office of Ledge Council. But in this case, since the report is coming from DMH, it would likely um, be proposed through DMH. And um, if members chose to introduce it, it would come to Ledge Council at that point. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, we'd like to welcome you and give you an opportunity to comment if, if you'd like. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Grad. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Um, starting to feel like uh, we should start paying you folks rent uh, for being in your committee, Senate Judiciary, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, it's been a long haul, and I'm, I think kind of our perspective right now, I think we're good with this language. Uh, you know, we had some of the some of this conversation with some members of uh, with uh, House Healthcare yesterday, um, and uh, and such. And you know, I think it's our our hope that we're able to find some language that works between both the House side and the Senate side, because this is such important uh, legislation. And I know we're talking about some technical pieces within uh, the studies here, uh, but I don't want uh, that piece to to overshadow sections one, two, three, and four of this bill that have some really important uh, uh, legislation in them. Uh, but we are uh, in support of this. Uh, uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll make do with whatever timelines we really have to make do with. Uh, we recognize that we don't wanna push things out too far because this is such a, an important topic and, and has been something that that we have testified uh, and has been issues uh, for for a number of years, and uh, so we we like like both the Senate and the House uh, do not want this to go out longer than it than is necessary, uh, but having enough time to do uh, thoughtful and articulate uh, uh, research and study to to provide uh, uh, clear and concise information back to the legislature with uh, potential legislation uh, proposals. Uh, it's important that, that we work on, you know, having those, those uh, reasonable timelines. And so, you know, as I mentioned in House Healthcare yesterday, as we were kind of talking about some of this, uh, is we're good with the timelines and we, we ask folks to, you know, have the grace, you know, that, that this is one of the large, Now you're now you're frozen. <laughs> Must be, yeah. Huh. Uh, studies that, that we've been asked to really do work, opinion, and so uh, we're definitely in support of this, and we'll we'll do everything within our power to bring back to the legislature, uh, both for the uh, preliminary reports and final reports, uh, the information that uh, you all need to be able to 
move forward with any other uh, pieces related to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not seeing any hands, but I'll give folks a minute. Any questions? Martin. Yeah, a quick, uh, I think it's a quick question. So uh, we, uh, in, in, one of the, in the preliminary report due on January 15th, uh, we don't have uh, a preliminary report on the models for forensic treatment. Uh, instead, we have that under now C2 for uh, the preliminary work. Is that just to give a little bit more time on that aspect of, of the work? Is that, is that the idea for that? That's my understanding, yes. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's and and that's an important that's an important point because it, you know to have some separation between those between those two times because uh, this this committee had spoken about not wanting a um, sort of assumption or a foregone conclusion that there will be that there is a need for a, for a facility and and wanted to have some more more thought and research put into it and so that's what the hope is that by giving some space between those dates and reports. It'll, it'll allow for some, some groundwork um, to be done before, before um, any decisions or recommendations about a, a facility. So, thank you. Any, any other questions? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So if there aren't any other questions, um, I would entertain a motion that we approve draft 2.1 dated 5-19-2021 of S3. And um, this, is a, this is an amendment offered by um, Representative Lalonde, who's the reporter of the bill, um, that we concur in the Senate proposal of amendment to the House proposal of amendment with further proposal of amendment which is what we are looking at in draft 2.1 of S3. I'll make that motion. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have a second? Second. Okay. And Ken, let us know when you're, when you're ready to call the roll, please. Try it, just give me one second, please. That's fine, that's fine. Just take your time. Okay, you ready? Um, Chrissy? Yes. Colburn? Yes. Donnelly? Yes. Goslant? Yes. Lalon? Yes. Leffler? Norris? Yes. Not? Yes. Rachelson? Yes. Burdick? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Thank is, you. Is, uh, is uh, Representative Leffler going to be around this morning or? I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't heard, but why don't we hold it open for, for a little bit. Okay. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so with that, that does give us time to move to uh, the question of whether or not to send a letter to uh, the judiciary regarding six person juries. I said <laughs> it was a major shift in what we've been doing, but we do have a proposed letter on our website. I'm just not remembering, maybe Evan, if you could help me or Eric, um, where it would be. Uh, it's under your name and it's uh, posted to today's date. Today. Wonderful. Thank you. So, if, let's see. There we go. Okay. All right. So, seems like a long time ago, but we had discussed the, the issue of six person juries in the context of the um, pandemic, but also uh, in the context of 
access to justice, um, post-pandemic, helping with the um, backlog, and, um, and whether or not we looked at uh, legislation and we looked at uh, concerns about constitutionality. We, uh, we discussed the authority of the judiciary to do this um, on their end through their, through their rules. And um, the letter here is to ask them to continue to, to consider that. And um, actually, Eric, if I could turn it to you just to give, give us some more background. Also, um, the Senate uh, um, also sent a similar letter, uh, a little different, but if you could, Eric, if you could just give us some background and set the stage for, uh, for this letter that I am asking the committee to consider, please. Sure. Uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to talk with the committee about this possible proposed letter to the uh, judiciary regarding the six person juror issue. The, sort, the background, I think, that you're referring to Representative Grad is the notion that the letter proposes to uh, ask the court to use its emergency authority to uh, to implement the use of six person jurors, six person juries, at least during the period of emergency. And the the understanding there, or at least the the thought, is that you, you may recall that H-417 didn't ask the court to implement the six person juror approach by rule, but instead proposed to establish it by statute. And that's a, an important distinction because there appears to be a potential constitutional problem with requiring it by statute that could be uh, avoided by having the court do this by rule. And that's because of uh, a case mentioned, I mean, it's sort of not just because of the case, but, the, but a helpful point on that is a case that's referred to in the letter itself in which the court has done this before. This was in 1990 when, when there was a, an emergency as a result of a, a economic crisis, a financial crisis, and there was no money left to uh, in a lot of branches of the government, and there were rescissions ordered by the governor and by the legislature. And in the context of that, the court ordered the suspension of all jury trials for six months from January of uh, 1990 to the end of the fiscal year on July 1st of that year. So that the constitutionality of that was challenged in this case. The court said it was okay under its emergency authority and under its authority to administer the courts and the Vermont constitution. So the idea is, you know, if, if the court has the ability to suspend jury trials completely, then one would think that they would have the authority to take the less drastic, less severe step of saying, well, we're not suspending them completely, but for a period of time during an emergency, six person juries will be used. So there's some authority for the court doing this by rule uh, that would um, avoid the constitutional problem that uh, in non-emergency situations, it appears that jurors, juries have to be composed of 12 people. So that's the, the I think the rationale behind asking the court to do this by rule rather than passing a statute. And as the chair mentioned, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee had sent a, a you know, somewhat similar, not entirely similar, didn't, didn't focus on the uh, this court case, which I think is very helpful, but the Senate letter was a bit more of a bigger picture letter in January, also asking the court to, um, to implement a six person jury uh, procedure. Didn't do that at the time, but uh, this letter proposes essentially that they take another look at it and do it now. I think that's kind of the, the summary of where the background is. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Tom. Sure. Thank you. First off, it's hard to believe that 1990 was 31 years ago. <laughs> right. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. um, Eric. I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I'm going to assume that uh, that back then when they went to six person that it wasn't challenged. You mean in 1990? Yes. Yes. Well, actually, in 1990, it wasn't even they didn't go to six persons. They suspended jury trials completely. Oh, uh, right. Right. OK. OK. And, and it was challenged. That's that's the case that's referred to in the letter. Some some litigants challenged that as being a violation of the constitutional right to a jury trial under Vermont constitution. And the court said, no, 
it's not a violation of that right because this is a, a limited temporary emergency step that the court has the authority to, to take under the uh, portion right. of the constitution that gives the court administrative control over the courts. Okay, so, so sometimes I need to hear things two or three times for it to, to sink in. <laughs> oh, that's fine, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, thank you. Yep. Ken and then Kate. Hi, good morning. Um, I could see sending this uh, letter if we were still operating under uh, January guidelines. We're about, all the restrictions are about to be lifted and all that. Um, I really, I think we're opening up a big can of worms doing this and, and I don't see the reason to do that. That's just my opinion. We're, um, we're um, very close to June 1st and uh, the governor already said by July 4th, we're gonna be open and we've already done uh, the, the courts of backlog. I'm not sure it's, it's because of juries. So I'm having a problem with this, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kate, and then Martin. Thanks. Um, I, I I think I, I support the letter. You know, I do think you know while while restrictions are shifting, I I do think that um, everyone has sort of varying degrees of sensitivity to their own health needs, and I think that this is going to be a transition for a while. I guess my, I feel like when we were listening to testimony on this, where I, my mind went was like putting our energy into trying to figure out a virtual method of jury selection and meeting, which it sounds like they were starting to work on um, and, and doing sort of like 12 person virtual jury versus like moving to a six person jury. Um, and so I guess, Again, I don't. It's not that I don't support this letter. I, I think that I, I do, and I would. But I guess my concern is that it would like disincentivize the courts from continuing to pursue um, a virtual method, which I think seems like would. It seems like it would be wise to continue to pursue that. Just moving forward, as I imagine, we're going to kind of be moving. As, as we move through this pandemic experience, I think there's probably going to be some like fits and starts. Um, so I, I guess that would be my thought. I don't know if I don't know if it seems like it makes sense to stick something in the letter. Like you know, we're encouraged to hear that you're working on virtual jury selection, and we would hope you continue on that you know track or something along those lines. But I guess that those would be my thoughts. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, Martin, Selena, can I see your your hand up? I don't know if it's from before, Coach. Go for it. Uh, so Martin. Yeah, um, actually a response to, to Ken and, and also to Kate. Uh, so the um, last couple paragraphs, not the very last one, but the two before the last paragraph ad address that issue that Ken brings up, that even the relaxed rules that they have uh, don't apply to you know, the close congregate settings, uh, which definitely a jury is. They are together in a, a small jury rooms uh, for extended periods of time. Uh, and the court, uh, you know, they, they have their own path and own guidelines uh, as far as for, for the public safety uh, that don't necessarily have to follow uh, the, the governors, you know, as a separate branch, they're, they're making up own safety rules. So to the extent that this continues to be a concern, uh, as far as the close congregate setting, uh, they may still uh, really limit the trials that they can have. Uh, and also, you know, this, this puts, you know, this isn't forcing anything. It's just uh, really a recommendation from us. And it's also a suggestion uh, to help, you know, forgetting about the close congregate settings or any of those things, we did hear uh, Pat Gable did agree uh, that six person juries could be more efficient, uh, could be more expeditious because you're drawing smaller juries, uh, you open up more space, etc. So uh, I think even with the relaxing uh, rules, which I'm delighted uh, is happening, uh, I think that uh, the court still 
have to really take uh, heed of the safety con uh, concerns and the concerns of jurors who may be reluctant to serve uh, because of their own risk tolerance. Uh, so that's one point. The other point as far as I think that we probably haven't heard enough on, on the pluses and minuses of virtual uh, jury trials and, and whether that's gonna be possible. I, I mean, if, if it is something that's workable, then that's great. And they are going to be uh, uh, doing a test run. Uh, and certainly they can, they can decide on their own whether this letter is sent to them or not, uh, that that is instead the approach to take. So I, I don't think we necessarily have to get into that given our level of knowledge of really how well virtual juries would work one way or another. So, thanks. Okay, I wanna make sure I get this right. I have Selena, Coach, Will, and then we will wrap up soon. We're not gonna take any action on this today because I do see that, that there's um, quite a bit of discussion uh, needed and I wanna you know, make sure that we have time for all of it, um, which it doesn't look like we will today. Selena. I support the letter, sending the letter, um, and especially, you know, I mean, if it's clear and maybe there's maybe there's some slight edits to the letter that would help with this, but that we're really just asking them to look at it and consider it, um, which is all we really have the authority to do here. I do think there's some really good points in the letter about even when things get quote unquote back to normal that we heard that um, in civil proceed, we heard testimony that in civil proceedings, you know, the six person jury could really speed things up and start to clear that those dockets out more quickly. And I think there's also really good, and this may be redundant with what uh, uh, others have said, but just to be on the record with my support, I think there's also really good points there about sort of the way that courtrooms and juries in particular kind of overlap with some of the congregate settings where those guidelines aren't going to be necessarily relaxed in the same way on the same timetable. And so for those reasons, I, I support I support just asking um, the judiciary to look at this. Thank you, appreciate that. Coach and then Will. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I won't reiterate a lot of things that other people have said, but I will share some of the things that came to me. Uh, one, during the testimony, uh, we heard very clearly uh, that uh, Justice Eaton uh, is heading up a group uh, to do uh, the uh, preliminary hybrid trial model. Okay, and uh, my understanding is by the end of the month, we'll know uh, how, um, you know, th there'll be a response uh, back to itself, basically. But the bottom line is uh, they're proactively looking at a hybrid. All of this, I think, is a hybrid. Um, and it's critical because there are going to be jury members uh, or jurors, I should say, that could actually ask to be uh, uh, not there because of that setting that Martin mentioned, you know, in his comments. And one of the other things that came up during our t what the testimony we heard, and I just wanted to kind of remind folks. Uh, the example given of the Wyndham County Courthouse. That's one of our newer courthouses. Uh, and like Rutland, uh, remembering that setting uh, and the smaller ones are just kind of out of the question in a lot of ways. But there, there's only three or four physical structures that allow for full um, 12 person jury settings. And remember what we were, what Judge Grierson and others shared with us was is that in order to do a trial, it would take three courtrooms to do that. So in Brattleboro, that's three floors. And so you're committing basically almost, you know, 78 to 
of the infrastructure of the courthouse to that one trial when normally you'd be having four five trials going on at the same time simultaneously so i think they're being very responsive and what our letter you know is doing is supporting some things asking you know for a few you know considerations uh based on you know the testimony we've heard and and also reminding them that we're in support of looking at hybrid uh, because basically even even you know with uh, the governor re relaxing um, uh, those space requirements and mass requirements they still left it up to the individual entities as far as businesses and entrepreneurs to follow their their best science you know, so so we, we've seen it already. Some businesses are saying, look, uh, because of our close congregate settings, uh, like the tattoo artist uh, that was on the news last night, they still use full fledged protocol because they have non vaccinated children coming in for ear piercing. You know, so I, I mean, th there's a lot of individual pieces that are moving here. So we just kind of have to be a uh, allowable i guess would be the thing so thank you yeah thank you coach you raised a lot of very important points i appreciate that uh will and then i'm gonna um wrap this up for for now go ahead will. thank you thank you i i have to admit to having a extreme level of discomfort with the letter um you know i i understand um the situation and i think it's been spelled out for us and just a couple of thoughts. One, I by no means want to discount where we are in the pandemic. Uh, personally, I haven't been vaccinated yet because I am in the window the CDC recommends between actually having COVID and, and when they recommend getting the vaccine. There are, there are people out there who cannot be vaccinated and um, I don't want to discount that. Um, but that said, I mean, we. I believe it's been expressed that what's proposed would not be allowable under the uh, Vermont Constitution um, without an emergency order. And while the pandemic is still with us, it, it is definitely changing. The, the number of people vaccinated is moving up. So I feel like I'm not certain using that as the justification for, for this emergency order um, balances the scales for me. Because for me, where the scales are really tipped is my concern about cutting jury size in half. I mean, we know that Vermont is not a diverse place. Um, we're going to see in jury pools, lots of people with similar life experiences, with, with, with similar thoughts, with similar backgrounds. And, and I worry that by cutting a jury from 12 to six, um, those two, three, four opinions that, that could uh, change an outcome, that, that could be the important perspective in the room, those may be lost. And, and for me, that is the part of, of this um, proposal that I am the most uncomfortable with and the part that even with the circumstances on the other side, I just can't get past. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody who, who weighed in. Let's appreciate the, the feedback and certainly need more, more discussion on this. Uh, so thank you. I do want to adjourn. Uh, very soon, I am hoping that S3 will be up this morning. So that way, assuming there are rules suspension, we can get it over to the Senate uh, ASAP because it is, it's such, a, such an important bill. Uh, the other thing we're watching is S97 that we did message that yesterday. So we need to, uh, need to see what, if anything, happens, changes with that. And I think that's all that we have sort of up in the air, but again, we never know. So before we, anything else before we adjourn? Nope, okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Evan, and just stay tuned for um, emails and I'll, I'll work on building a new list, uh, text, <laughs> text list, and uh, yes, we may need to come back together. I hope we'll come back together. So even if it's just to uh, just to say hi. <laughs> so thank you.